What if you were murdered simply for demanding the equal rights guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution? And what if you lay in your grave while your white-hooded killers roamed free, laughing at your memory and those you left behind? We'll meet the investigative journalist who answered those calls of blood for justice next. Uh, Mr. President, yeah. uh, I wanted to let you know we have found the car, but I did want you to know that apparently what's happened, these men have been killed. Now, as I say, the heat is so intense you can't tell on the inside that everything's been burned, whether there are any charred bodies or not. It is merely an assumption that probably they were burned in the car. Or maybe kidnapped and locked up. Well, I would doubt whether those people down there would, uh, would even give them that much of a break. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Now number one in podcasting, thanks to loyal listeners like you. That clip you just heard is President Lyndon Baines Johnson getting an update from FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover about the murder of three civil rights activists in what would become known as Mississippi burning case. In this episode, our time machine travels back to bear solemn witness to infamous moments in the fight for civil rights. Our story begins on June 21, 1964, when more than 20 Klansmen ambushed and murdered a trio of civil rights workers. The killer's identities were well known. One of them was the sheriff's deputy. And yet despite these open secrets, despite everybody knowing who had pulled the triggers, four decades passed without anybody seeing the inside of a prison cell. At that late date, the ringleader of this cowardly act at last faced trial and conviction. And that's thanks in great part to the man we'll be interviewing today. His name is Jerry Mitchell, and his book is titled Race Against Time. A reporter reopens the unsolved murder cases of the civil rights era. This unique memoir covers our guests' efforts in the assassination of Medgar Evers, the 16th Street Church bombing, and the firebombing of Vernon Damer, dedication that ultimately landed four Klansmen in prison for the rest of their lives, finally bringing some measure of closure to those these civil rights icons had left behind. Jerry Mitchell has been a reporter in Mississippi since 1996, earning over 30 national awards and founding the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting, a nonprofit that carries on his work of exposing injustices and raising up a new generation of investigative reporters. You can learn more about our guest and his mission at MississippiCIR.org and by following him at J. Mitchell News on Twitter. Okay. Now that we've arrived at the bloody ground zero of the fight for civil rights, let's join Jerry Mitchell and explore his memoir, Race Against Time. I'm joined on the line by Jerry Mitchell, author of Race Against Time, a reporter reopens the unsolved murder cases of the civil rights era. Thank you for making time to discuss your book with the History Author Show, sir. Absolutely. This is great, Dean. Thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed the book. I, I just tore through it. I'm somebody who's very much into news. I read these stories, and not to sound too full of myself, but when I see injustice, it bugs me. Maybe it comes from being picked on as a young kid a yeah. lot in school. And when I see justice denied, it draws me right in. And this happens to you. I suppose this is what puts you in that movie theater when you begin Race Against Time in 1988. You go to see the film Mississippi Burning, and by serendipity, I guess you'd call it, you end up in the same theater as Roy K. Moore, the retired FBI special agent in charge Mm -hmm. who investigates the 1964 slaying of those three civil rights activists that were immortalized in that film. Where did you work at the time, and what about Mr. Moore's reaction to the film piqued your interest and made you think, with your journalist hat on at the time, hey, let me let me talk to this guy a little, and I can flesh out a little bit of the story I'm going to write tomorrow. 
Yeah, I, I was working at the Clarion Ledger statewide newspaper in Mississippi. I was a courts reporter. I just basically covered courts. I think what piqued my interest was when he and another FBI agent kind of after the movie was over started talking about the case and about how basically these 20 something Klansmen who were involved in killing these three young men, you know, James Cheney, Andy Goodman, and Mickey Schwerner, they'd never been tried for murder in the state of Mississippi, never were tried for murder. And I was just like, well, why not? You know, I, I thought that was a pretty logical <laughs> question, you know. And so it was the pursuit of that question, I guess you could say, that really kind of jump started my journey into these unsolved murder cases from the civil rights era. Race Against Time also grabbed me because not only is it your memoir, and I love a memoir, and you recently mentioned that to me that you read it yourself for the audiobook version, if people want to check that out, because who better to tell your story than the author? I, I always find that a nice bit of synergy, which is something else that I like, because I, I like things to sync up, and I want to hear this in your voice when I'm listening to an audiobook if it's your memoir, but... It's not just a story of you on the outside. It's the classic case of you getting pulled into it and becoming part of the story, and certainly not in a way that you would want to. Mm -hmm. A man tells you flat out at one point in Philadelphia, he says, oh, yeah, the KKK wants to kill you. Right. And you laugh it off. Yeah, and I, I mentioned earlier when you laughed a little, you said, yeah, that's that's one of the ways that you that you cope with it, right? right. You, you have, you to, have and, to. Or else you're going to crawl under your porch, right, and just forget about mm -hmm. it. Absolutely. It becomes routine for you to check under the hood of your car to make sure there's not a bomb in there. You, Your wife is, of course, concerned about you, and here you're going to go meet these Klansmen out in the middle of nowhere, and knowing that they're loaded with guns and you're going to try to interview them, mm -hmm. it's daunting stuff. And throughout your reporting, people are telling you, hey, leave the past mm -hmm. alone, let sleeping dogs lie, this is the New South, these these people are, are dead and gone, you're never going to get justice for these people. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always a million people telling you you can't and why you shouldn't, right? So I wondered if there were any similar concerns about publishing this book. Did people still tell you, eh, maybe you just don't want to dig into the past, eh, oh. don't dig these stories up? Oh, yeah. I mean, I still have people sometimes tell me that, not as much as before. But, you know, obviously somebody could kill me if they chose to, but I am a person of faith, and I just think it means I get to go home sooner, if that makes any sense at sure all. Sure it does. But uh, to be honest, you know, when you're an in investigative reporter, people are going to come after you. I mean, you know, if it's threats or it's pressure, it's intimidation, they're going to call your publisher, whatever it is they're going to try to respond in some way or another, either before the story's published or after the story's published. I just kind of tend to think of those who try that tactic are kind of bullies. And like you, I was kind of the, the kid picked on in the playground, you know? <laughs> and, and so I've never taken very well to bullies. And so I just think of it as kind of bullying tactics. And I just, you know, in fact, I had somebody who was trying to intimidate me on something uh, within the past year, and I was laughing to myself. I was saying, "Oh, please! I've been, I've been threatened by Klansmen. You know, like an intimidate me <laughs> or something. You know, yeah. You do your worst. A couple of tweets against me or something is not going to shake you off. Right? Yeah, I mean, come on. I also wanted to mention in there. You, you talk about faith. I want to get to that in a minute, but you cover these guys who, or these men, these civil rights mm -hmm. leaders, and in the case of the bombing in Burl Birmingham, Alabama, these young girls. Yeah. But the thing is, when somebody dies violently, their life story gets obscured by the flash of the gunshot or yeah. the case of the 16th Street bombing and the explosion. You know, we yeah. we tend to define them, whether it's Abraham Lincoln, you know, he's forever there on that balcony being shot. And yeah. I try to fight against it myself. For instance, Medgar Evers storming Normandy Beach in the D-Day landings and just the second black applicant to the University of Mississippi's law school. And he has a, a great line there, something about how, you know, yes, I'm, I'm going to stay this color. So right. that brings the guy alive and it denies the man who shot him the opportunity to erase that right. life. You know, just like with Lincoln that I mentioned mm -hmm. or anybody, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a coincidence, I guess, that I mentioned Lincoln or that he comes to mind. So I like that. And I like that you in Race Against Time talk about those survivors. Mm -hmm. For instance, you spoke to Ever's widow mm -hmm. and you wrote, quote, she helped me understand Medgar Evers as a husband, as a father, as more than a civil rights martyr. Mm -hmm. 
So when you go and meet with her, how do you handle her as a source? Yeah, I, I think with any family member any in these kind of situations, you obviously want to be very mindful of what they've been through. I, I think, you know, as a reporter, it's obviously you can be very eager to, uh, to dive in and want the details, the nitty gritty details, but obviously it's still very painful for them. I know that Ellie Damer, the widow of Vernon Damer, told me, it want, you know, said at one point, it will never be the past for us. It may seem like to every one of us, oh, that's 30 years ago. But for those families, it's just as painful as if it happened yesterday. I mean, it, it, it is still painful to them. And so you, you, so you want to try to seek, obviously, to be empathetic, to be sympathetic, to simply pause and give the families time. And I think that's very important just be to be there and to take your time in developing them. But they are valuable sources because they often they are witnesses to the crime sometimes and, and other information that they have that's incredibly valuable, you know, to use as a reporter. And it has to help you get things that you wouldn't get otherwise. And I know Correct. when I've interviewed people like yourself or whatever it is, it's mm -hmm. sometimes just that moment when you approach them and read the person and have that empathy, then they want to speak exactly. with you and they want to know that you care. Exactly. Because it is 30 years later for Medgar Evers' widow, she's been asked a million times. She's had people come, I'm sure, and sit in her living room and, and you drink coffee out of her coffee cup and share a few minutes with her and she never hears from mm -hmm. them again mm -hmm. and they or they don't do the story right or they didn't listen and so it's an added challenge and especially since they have to be so broken down by the fact that that nobody cared and everyone tells yeah. her as well and all these people well just give exactly. up there's never going to be justice exactly you and and you don't want to end up like your husband right, right exactly so just let it go yeah, you know one of the things that Merle ever told me at one point she pointed to a scar she had and she said you know this is i mean it just is a wound and it needs to heal and, and and it hasn't been able to heal and i think justice can help to heal those wounds and it, it's so true i mean that it's a wound that's never healed and so yeah it's it's so true and so they they need that they that, that's what i think justice helps to bring it's certainly not totally satisfying it's coming late and you know et cetera, et cetera. but uh, at least from the families i've talked to they're they've been very grateful to see the justice that has come i mean the scar would remain but at least it would be healed it's not not a festering wound exactly. it's not, i mean every every christmas everybody knows mm -hmm. that that's let's lost somebody but it, you can't imagine violently and you're seeing mm -hmm. these people even if it's just metaphorically you know they're out there they're with their family this christmas it's, they're with their loved ones on their birthday and you're not you mm -hmm. know and they're raising their kids and you're raising your kids alone yeah. i mean that's the classic insult to injury yes. or maybe you'd say salt in the wound mm -hmm. to continue that metaphor yes absolutely in race against time you introduce us to byron de la beckwith and you mentioned there as an aside that a musical name for a really foul character, he's a member of the White Citizens Council and the Ku Klux Klan, because in part he doesn't think that KKK is radical and hateful enough, if you can believe it, dear listeners. He escapes conviction for murdering Medgar Evers, and people know, and in fact he shouts at one point, yeah, he's standing right behind you. Is that, to, is that the Dr. King? Is that him? Yeah, you're talking about... Uh... Oh, you're talking about with regard to what Edgar Ray Kilden said about, about Martin Luther King? Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah, later. The, yeah, Martin, yeah. Edgar Ray Kilden talked about Martin Luther King and wanted to shake his killer's hand. Yeah. It's a broken mirror image here when you deal with this guy, with Beckwith, yeah. of when you're speaking to the widow Evers. And that's how it struck me in the book. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you write that you're sitting there and part of you wants to argue back at this racism that he's spewing. He sits you down, he, see, he asks you all about your background. It's really quite creepy. You know, he basically wants to read your DNA. And so I, I, I imagine it is like if you were uh, in Nazi Germany, this is how they were right. investigating you to see if you were worthy to even speak to. So what did you gain from that approach? How was that different? Because you write, you felt that urge to shut the guy down. Mm -hmm. When you listen to somebody speak like that, 
you feel yourself that, hey, I'm letting that that come out. I'm not standing up against it. That They're going to think I agree with them. <laughs> and yet you're not there as just a regular Joe. You're there as a journalist and you want to put the guy away or have a role in that. Sure. So what did you gain from that approach that you wouldn't have gotten if you'd given in to your revulsion? Yeah, I, I you know, I was certainly outraged that Beckwith and Sam Byers both would – and all of the guys would turn Christianity from, you know, religion of love, I consider it, to, to one of hate. And that that upset me. But as a journalist, you know, your job is to listen, really, and to try to gather information. And so he would have thrown me out of the house, you know what I mean? He would have, like, tossed me out and go, don't come back, you know, uh, if, if I had objected. I think that's the right approach. It's kind of the opposite. I always say it's the opposite of Mike Wallace. You know, instead of coming in with guns blazing, you know, with a television camera rolling, you know, you try to sit back and listen. And, and I, at least I've found, in, at least in my experience, that's a better way of getting more information. Because a lot of times the information they give you may be just the information that would lead to conviction. And that's a really a good point or a good comparison to the Mike Wallace, because when you come in there, I mean, the thing with him is when he brings you in and he's in a studio or in your office with the cameras, that's that's intended to elicit a different response mm-hmm. because he's holding the cards there and he's going to ask you flat out, you know, how come you were lying about cigarette research or right. something, you exactly. know? But for you, if he sh- if he shuts down, that's mm-hmm. it. If he, if he stops talking, that's it. You don't you you have to persuade him. It's very much like you know, what we see in movies, right? You got to get the bad guy to start telling you his exactly. his plan, right? If he doesn't start giving you exposition. And in his case, bragging yeah. about it. He wants to brag about what he did, mm-hmm. whether that he murdered this guy and got away with it. You have to be willing to win his confidence, as, as painful as that no, might be. I as, think it's as, true. I think it's true. As disgusting as it is to you, you got to do it, right? I, I think that's exactly what you do. And uh, you take, as journalists, what you're doing, in a sense, is you're taking advantage of the fact that most people, especially when they're older, want to share their life story. And so that's what that's simply what I did when I sat there with Byron Dale with that thing. When you face Sam Bowers, the imperial wizard of the White Knights of the KKK in Mississippi, there was a detail in Race Against Time. He's wearing a Mickey Mouse button <laughs> on his lapel. Yes, he is. It seems re- really strange, right? And then at the end of that chapter, you describe a threatening voicemail that you got. Yeah. And the message says that the resurrected clan, quote, will make the old one look like Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Now, I don't think that you drew the connection in the book, but was that a reference to his pin? I couldn't help but think it was. And I think someone showed up at that rally, that kind of, for lack of their term, you know, white supremacist rally that they had as well, which I think didn't make the cut, but actually happened back then. And some guy was wearing a Mickey Mouse button. So I didn't know if it was that guy or not. But anyway, it was an interesting reference. Kind of strange thing to have seen. It's a, it's already so surreal. Yeah, and then, yeah. Wait a minute. What the heck is he doing? Wearing the, yeah. <laughs> wearing the mouse, right? Ooh. And I don't want to give people the impression either that you have the full backing of the Clarion Ledger. You are told at some point, it's Ken Lawrence, I believe, he tells you, you know, that they should apologize for the coverage at the time. And you also have a job to do. This is not just, you're not an independently wealthy single reporter out there just questing for justice you do have a job Mm -hmm. this is some years ago right you're just starting out i think in 1986 so this is 1988 mississippi burning movie comes out you start all this how was that how how was dealing with the newspaper and how did that impact your ability to track these stories down well i i'd say for the most part the newspaper was, was very supportive and let me do it although initially what i did is tried to i basically worked off the clock or whatever you want to call it I worked on these cases at night. I would work on them, not necessarily during the regular hours, although over time that began to change. I you know, began to read books and learn more about the cases, read the microfilm, all those kind of things. But gradually, you know, the, the support came over time. And it was really only one editor that, that wasn't as supportive. Benny Ivory, who was the editor, was extremely supportive, and, and, as well as others. I wanted to go back to a second. You, you said a couple of things there. You said you're a person of faith, and I mentioned that thing about him asking you about Christianity or if you're a Christian, yeah. and you write that 
you say yes to them, though you're sure that it's not the same brand as his, the stuff that they are twisting and adding and finding somehow in the Old and New Testaments of the Bible mm-hmm. is justification or just insane. I forgot was well, something about the snake. I, I just I tried to expunge it from oh, my no, mind as quickly as I ridiculous. could because when I, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, that, yeah, that was my mentality. I was just upset, you know, about that. And that they would turn Christianity from a religion of love into religion of hate. And that that upset me. It angered me. It it probably helped fuel me, too. You know, the fact that that someone would go around and claim to have that name, like like Beckwith. And you also want to... You want to fight back against it. And I, I thought of that here because, of course, whenever there's an, an act of terrorism, we'll always find some Muslims mm-hmm. that are saying, you know, this really offends exactly. me. I'm a Christian. I'm not of the Islamic faith, but my family comes from Asia Minor, and there's Turks over there. Mm-hmm. The first Gulf War, I remember a fellow walked into a room, was at that animal hospital, actually, and he said, he, like, stopped in his track and said, looked like somebody from the Middle East. He'd just come back from over in mm-hmm. Iraq. And after 9-11, I wow. shaved, and they, they checked me, you know, in the, on the plane. Wow. And then they look at my last name and say, oh, he's just a Greek. It's okay. Let him, let him go. I mean, literally, wow. that kind of thing. And so you don't want people to think, because you have an accent, you know, you have a New Jersey accent like mine, which I tend to try to suppress when I do interviews. <laughs> but uh, people are going to get one impression, right? Oh, sure. he must be in the mob. Yeah, yeah. And if you're especially Italian from New Jersey, yeah, no and you, you know, you have a southern accent, you're a Christian. You don't want people looking at you and saying, oh, hey, he's one of those people. And look, those those people are all in the clan. Right. That's personal for you. You you haven't lost somebody, a father, a son, a sister, a brother, but you feel invested and in you make their fight yours so that people will see right. that you can't judge a book by its right. cover. We're, we're not all like that. And we can make amends and make things different. I love that part of the book. I thought that that was great because you're not sitting there feeling victimized. You're mm-hmm. not like so many people who want to paper over it wherever it is. But you're saying, hey, I'm going to do what I can to change this mm-hmm. and to show that there is some justice. Right. You know, we, we hear about the New South, and I really want it to be a New South, so let me do what I can. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's important. I'd like to ask you quickly about the cover of Race Against yeah. Time, because you didn't choose you didn't choose the victims on there, and, and I know often people will want a lot of faces, or maybe I should say the heroes instead of casting them as victims mm-hmm. or the martyrs. Right. But you decided you they they use the car there from the Mississippi burning case. Why that choice for the cover and not the faces looking out at us from history, begging for justice? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh... That's the one they picked. (laughs) (laughs) Um, At least for me, I think it reflects the horror. I think the photograph kind of reflects, without being grotesque or um, over the top, I don't know, it would would seem kind of over the top and and not as compelling. I think what makes the cover more compelling, I think, is to have something that reflects the horror as opposed to just, you know, sticking up photos of victims or something like that. I don't know. It it doesn't feel right. I think what I wanted, and I think they wanted too, was to reflect the horror of what happened without being grotesque, without being, um, certainly there were photos we could have used that that could have been even, could, could have been that. So this was a reflection of really trying to carry the message through, uh, reflect that horror without being grotesque. You're listening to my conversation with Jerry Mitchell. He's the author of Race Against Time. A reporter reopens the unsolved murder cases of the civil rights era. Remember to check out MississippiCIR.org or to follow him at News on Twitter. Taylor Branch, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Parting the Waters, writes of the book, quote, Jerry Mitchell's memoir revives promise for journalism. In this stirring insider's account of four notorious crimes from the 1960s, his tenacious allies defy race and resignation to win historic miracles for justice. I want to focus on that idea of reviving journalism's promise because it follows right on the heels of what we were just talking about. People hear you're in journalism, hear you're in news, 
much less people who have actually been in it and gotten cynical about it. Like, you know, like myself, nobody wants to see how the sausage is made, right? Right. It fuels you to say, hey, I want this career to be what I want it to be. I don't want it to be what people say it is from the outside. I don't want to let those bad apples, Mm -hmm. however many there are, taint Mm -hmm. it. If good people don't stay in there and stick it out, I mean, you could have moved. You could have said, boy, these people in Mississippi, or I don't want to, I don't want to live here anymore and move somewhere else. Instead, you stay and fight. Let's stay and fight and change the places mm-hmm. that, that we don't like or the things we don't like about right. them. And I've worked in news myself for 25 years now. And I, as I was reading your bio and that you start this nonprofit, I thought it can really drain the enthusiasm out of young people in the industry. And I think that Race Against Time is the perfect book to read to show that you can make that important positive difference even just by yourself. Mm-hmm. So I wondered, how do you hope that your book will inspire the interns and PAs in today's newsroom to be tomorrow's ace reporters and to really make journalism what the ideal is and not what a lot of it devolved into being today and recapture some of that public trust, just like you helped recapture it for the people of Mississippi who Mm -hmm. now can hope for equal justice under the law. Well, I hope Race Against Time, you know, does inspire, you know, today's reporters, tomorrow's reporters, the new generation reporters, just like all the president's men, you know, inspired me. It made me want to pursue investigative reporting as a career. So hmm. I think books and, and movies can inspire us to want to, you know, to do better. And I think that's the role journalism hopefully does. I think journalism is one of the most noble professions in the world. And I think what we need to do as journalists is just do the right thing. And don't worry so much about defending ourselves on social media or wherever, and just do the right thing. And I think these things work themselves out. Obviously, we're always going to get criticized. I mean, there's no question what we do gets criticized in one form or another, but it's not our job to sit around and defend ourselves all the time. It's our job to do our job and do it right. The success that you start to have brings phone calls, as success always does. Try winning the lottery, right? You suddenly hear from relatives you never knew. (laughs) So (laughs) once you do make a name for yourself as a journalist, who cares? Who gets results? Who's dedicated to those high ideals that we learn about in journalism school? Mm -hmm. People who the system has given up on and who have given up on the system Decide, maybe they'll track you down. Sure. So these survivors approach you asking for justice about their loved ones. How did you decide which of those stories to seek out at the newspaper? Because I'm sure it could overwhelm you. There's only one you. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's part of the reason why you started the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting yeah. to carry on the work you couldn't do. But how did you decide what to track down when it was just you alone? Well, certainly other reporters helped me at the Clarion Ledger. I wasn't alone in all my coverage. But in terms of these cases, my approach tended to be, because I knew it was a race against time, I tended to look at the cases and begin to judge how viable they were. You know, are the suspects still alive? What witnesses are still alive? Is there a transcript of the trial, which proved, as you saw in the book, proved valuable and really invaluable? In, in these cases in terms of presenting evidence of witnesses that were dead. And so, you know, we're talking about what the last case that's over 40 years when the trial actually takes place. So you, you have to preserve the evidence in one way or another to be able to present it at trial. And so that's really what my mentality is. But I certainly listened to all the families and did my best to pursue the cases I could. And um, but unfortunately, you're right, there was one of me. And so I tended to kind of rank them in terms of viability and pursue those that I thought were the most viable, knowing there was no way I could get to all the cases. Better to do one or to do two or four, the four that you cover here in the book, than to just throw your hands up. Somebody had to look. And also, there's something to be said for the fact that it strikes fear into the minds of people mm-hmm. who, unlike the relatives of the victims, are thinking of those victims all the time. These people that get away with it, they're just living their lives. Yeah. And if anything, it's a 
it, it's a point of honor. I mean, they would, I was going to say they could hang the, a piece of, you know, just like if they hung a, you know, a boar's head or something on the wall or a deer, but that's actually one of the things in the book there. We have the rifle that somebody's got on their mantle, right? <laughs> so with this, this is just a trophy, but you, by going after some of them, even if you can't go after all of them, it does make them look over their shoulder for a change. Mm-hmm. It does make maybe them have a sleepless night. Right. It's not justice. It's not spending the rest of your life in a prison cell, but at least it causes them some discomfort. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. In September of 1963, a bomb murdered four young girls at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. How did investigating those killings differ from the other cases where you dealt with adults, you just spoke about witnesses and how you had to race against time, which is your title, that's where your title comes from, to uncover those witnesses and facts before the major players passed away or, say, records were lost or destroyed over time? How did it differ or did it differ? Because Mm -hmm. those women wouldn't have been in their 70s and 80s by then, their classmates they would have been adults. They would have maybe been about your age. Mm-hmm. So how did that differ, investigating in that case? Also, because it is children, it's, yeah. it had to be harder. How did it differ? Well, the fact that the Klan killed these young girls, I mean, certainly made this case the most poignant and, and harrowing, I think, of all the cases that I worked on. I know when the verdict came, there were tears in the eyes of not only the families, but FBI agents, experts, prosecutors, and even most of the people in the audience, you know, were in tears. So it was a very emotional case. Not that all of them aren't emotional, but that one, especially when you're talking about these young girls being killed by a bomb in a church. Here they are expressing their right to freedom of religion. And the Klan bombs the church and kills them, the four innocent girls. And so it really was. And I think everybody who worked on that case, you know, I'm talking about on the law enforcement side of things, who were very moved by it, very moved by it. And I certainly was very moved by it as well. And I mentioned at the top of the interview about the Mississippi burning movie. That was just serendipity that you find yourself there and that FBI Mm -hmm. special agent happens to be Mr. Moore in the theater. That's something, huh? How life can turn on on just that moment and you end up sitting there and hearing him. Like the one good time to to have somebody talking in a movie, right? Absolutely. (laughs) Just happens to talk. Yeah, the one time. Amazing. Yeah, the one time I sat in a movie theater where I didn't didn't get angry at the person who, who started talking. Yeah. That's something else. I just thought that was a amazing moment to be put there. I mean, no kidding. You say you're a person of faith. It's easy to see the hand there of fate and of God putting you in there mm-hmm. to do the right thing and help these people. It's a thread. You know, you have people there at home and what can they do but pray for somebody to bring them some justice, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't want to let that pass because no, that's absolutely. pretty cool. You know? It was. It was wild. <laughs> There's another moment with a widow in Race Against Time. This time, it's with civil rights leader Vernon Damer's wife, Ellie. Billy Roy Pitts approaches her after turning state's evidence, and he asks her for forgiveness. She says, I forgive you, and they share a moment and cry together. Moments like that are truly humbling, and this is one thing that we're called on to do is to forgive, right? What can we all learn? We all have very small slights, I'm sure, by comparison. Hopefully none of us that are listening or you or I have somebody who is murdered violently. And here this person comes up and expresses apologies for what he did, expresses regret, says he's been praying for them every day and been asking for forgiveness himself. And she does it. She extends that forgiveness. Talk about the the real Bible, not Beckwith's Bible. We forgive also for ourselves. We don't just forgive for the person that we're giving forgiveness to. You don't want to carry that bitterness around. So what can we learn about forgiveness? What did you learn about forgiveness from that story and moments like it in your book where you had to just be in awe of it? Because I know I am. I was. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's, I think, one of the main reasons I wanted to do this book was these moments that, like, to me, that was the most incredible, one of the most incredible moments I've ever witnessed. And I just felt fortunate to be a witness of that and uh, wanted to share that. It was, you know, for those of us of faith, I mean, obviously, it was a reflection of that. I mean, because who forgives a killer, right? Someone who killed your loved one, right? Who forgives that? And so, obviously, it's very godlike. I mean, you know, uh, being 
being forgiven for something that we don't deserve forgiveness for. So that was an incredible moment to witness that. And just the fact that beyond faith, I mean, I think just the idea of someone being that willing to forgive. And I, I was I was truly touched by that moment. I really was. Well, you couldn't help but be. I mean, I was touched just reading it. You know, I mean, that'll stick with me forever because it's incredible. I can't imagine such love. I mean, I mentioned Abraham Lincoln being shot and that defining him. He dies or at least is incapacitated relatively instantly compared to William McKinley, who lingers. And he's alive when he's shot by his assassin, President McKinley. And people set upon him. They're ready to lynch the guy who shoots him, Leon Cholgosh. And McKinley says, go easy on him, boys. Don't let them hurt him. I, I can't be like that. I want to be more like that. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah we want to, but it, it's tough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, McKinley, also a, a big Christian, and the guy believed that, and he was a forgiving sort, and he, he says this thing, I'm a poor hater. And it's interesting because we use the term hate very much now. And Woodrow Wilson, mm-hmm. I read recently, he says uh, he's a really good hater, somebody said at the time. So I guess they said <laughs> it. And it's interesting that – 100 years later, 120 years later, that term comes back into use that you're a hater, but it's throwing it at other people. It's not working on ourselves anymore, right. saying, I'm a, I'm a good hater, I'm a bad hater, right? right? How do you do that? I mean, if it was me and I got shot in the chest, I, I got to say, I don't know if I'd care if they beat the heck out of the guy who had just shot me in the chest. Right. These stories are so personal because you have racism. They, they made it personal, the clan that does they this. Did. It's just incredible to me that people who dealt with that so personally, not only were able to forgive, but that they're connected somehow, that they managed to find an advocate in you who says, I'm going to put literally my life on the line and my career or apply what I have in my career, what I've learned to help them and to try to bring some justice. And maybe that justice is the only way that you get to that forgiveness or at least the opportunity for it. You can't make all those Klansmen come around and everybody did something wrong, but you, you can open it up and by doing it, you, you have a moment there that maybe that scab there over that healed wound can fade a little bit. Well, I think what happens is in order to get justice, you have to have truth. And I think that, that, you know, that, that's what has to happen, you know, initially, is that truth has to happen. And once, once justice happens, then you can have reconciliation. If you, you know, some people don't like that term, reconciliation, redemption, whatever that moment of forgiveness, you know, because it came after justice, the reconciliation came after justice. And so I think that's a good point as well. It doesn't need to be lost. What role did Billy Roy Pitts play in Damer's assassination? Well, he was involved in the killing. I mean, according to testimony, he stood outside the house and basically guarded while someone else threw the Molotov cocktail, set the house on fire. He had his gun and, and basically dropped the gun, and that's how he got caught. There are a lot of characters. And all with a lot of them with three names, too, which oh, makes it a little difficult. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this must be hard to keep them straight. Yeah. You list the four Klansmen you write about who are spending the rest of their lives in prison, but you note that they were far from the only killers you looked into and, quote, I failed more often than I succeeded. And that's something that you just referred to a little while ago. You've been called the South Simon Wiesenthal, and it made me think that Simon Wiesenthal caused a stir late in his life when he said that there were no more Nazis worth pursuing, that there was no more need for that part of the work trying to bring these high-level guys to justice because most of them had already died. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're at that point now, or do you still hold out hope for cases like Emmett Till, Warless Jackson, the Reverend James Reeb and others you mentioned in Race Against Time. Well, I still hope there can be prosecutions in these unsolved murder cases, although I would say, obviously, the odds are against it right now. But obviously, even if we can't pursue those particular cases, we can continue to pursue justice, you know, wherever possible, either in other murder cases or cases you know, where people have been wrongly convicted even. I mean, I think that obviously justice is, is what what's the key in those kinds of cases. People seeking justice will never go out of business, unfortunately. There'll always be a need for, for people tracking them down, Absolutely. whether it's these or some other horrible crime that's perpetrated on somebody because of their race or religion or all yes. the other reasons that human beings seem to find to hate each other, right? 
Absolutely. We have time for one final question, and it comes from something that Medgar Evers' brother Charles said to you. He said, quote, I'm sick and tired of these politicians politicizing off my brother's name. How do you hope readers will react to stories in your book so that martyrs don't become just another rhetorical device that we use to beat up our opponents, or in your case, to beat up Christians, to beat up Mississippi, to beat up the South in general, or anybody that that we don't like that we look at as just being a different background than us? How do you hope that people will tone down some of that politics. I don't even know if it's possible, but <laughs> to use it to beat up people. I, I, I like to think that's why I ask the question. I don't have to answer it. Right. But <laughs> how do you hope your readers will react to that? And look at these as real people. They're not rhetorical devices. They're not yeah. to be used to beat people. with. Well, I hope that with all the characters in my book that people can see them in a three dimensional sense, especially, you know, the bigger characters, they see their flaws as or like for someone like Beckwith, you actually see some good attributes, you know, like he dotes on his wife, even though he's pretty vile in a lot of ways. He's very doting on his wife and treats her very kindly, et cetera, those kinds of things. And so what you want with the martyrs is for them to be three-dimensional. You, you know, like a Martin Luther King, I think it's important to see him as three-dimensional and not just, you know, kind of this larger than life person who never did any wrong. I think it's more valuable to see them as human and Megar Evers and others. And what courage, you know, Megar Evers and Vernon Damer and the others, uh, you know, had for, for what they did. I mean, they, they could have been killed at any moment and, and obviously both were killed, but they continued to pursue it for many years before that happened. I think it's absolutely true what you're saying because if we say these people are somehow special yes. or somehow gifted beyond us, then it's a way that we can very easily slip from that to excusing ourselves. Well, I'm no, yes. I'm no Martin Luther King. I don't have to right. stand up for anything. Or maybe I'm no Jerry Mitchell if I'm a reporter and say he had something that I don't. Well, if we all think that way, no one ever would. Mm-hmm. You know, he could have just said, well, well, I'm, I'm not the man my father was as a junior. Or right. He gave me this name. Right. And if there's any reasons for us to say I can't be the guy or I can't be mm-hmm. the woman or the person who stands up for justice. But I, I think that's a very important part of this that people sometimes forget. We're not insulting the great man, the Martin Luther King or the right. Winston Churchill, George Washington or Lincoln by saying, hey, you know, they did some they did some bad stuff, too. They had depression. They had things they did wrong. They Right. They stumbled. Everybody stumbled. Absolutely. Jesus lost his temper in the temple, smashed it apart. So if he, if he loses his temper every now and then, maybe I do. Maybe it's okay for you, right? <laughs> We're not put here to be perfect. We're put here to be the yeah. best that we can be in these situations. So I, I'm very glad that you answered the question. That yeah, and, and I think the thing, too, that I hope people take away is the courage of the families as well who persisted and, and never gave up until they found justice. So I, I think you know, I don't think people know, for instance, like most people are going to know the Vernon Damer case. So I think that hopefully that, you know, families like that and obviously the Mega Rivers family that may not know as well either and uh, may know Mega Rivers, but not his family. And so hopefully they can see that and begin to um, understand how just kind of ordinary people can basically do extraordinary things if they believe. Well, Jerry Mitchell, author of Race Against Time, I want to thank you once again for joining me today and for your work, for digging into some of America's most notorious murders and bringing those murderers to justice. You helped break the back of the KKK. You helped make them look over their shoulder, make them wonder what that bump is in the night when they hear it. And you also did it at great personal risk to yourself and stress and suffering to your wife, as you discuss Mm -hmm. in your memoir here. God bless her. I want to, I want to thank her for supporting you. That's great. Yeah. God bless (laughs) her for putting up with me. I, I, as I look back, I realize how crazy I was. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. You were young. You're a young man, right? You're in your late twenties only when you started the paper, you're what? 27. Yeah. 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 So, oh, well. yeah, you're a young guy. And fortunately for us, we don't know so much when we're that age, right? We think we'll, yeah. <laughs> we're, we take risks we wouldn't. So that's why I said those PAs and interns out there, this is a, this is a game for the young. So we're counting on you for the future. I truly believe that like the men and women in those days, when Mississippi burned, you too, sir, are an inspiration. You are a hero and a role model 
So I hope readers will pick up your book and get inspired themselves as we work to build that more perfect world and bring more justice. Let justice be the rule instead of the exception in these cases. Yes, yes, I, I, think, I think that's hopefully that's what, what happens. And we're trying to do that with our nonprofit, the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting, where we're kind of raised up the, the next generation of investigative reporters. That's MississippiCIR.org, right? Absolutely. For people who want to learn more. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for continuing your work and doing more than just writing a book and putting it on a shelf. I'm glad that it's a living and breathing fight for justice. Thanks so much. We for naturally time. expect thank you so that much. those responsible for these terrible murders will be brought to justice. Only enforcement of constitutional and human rights will assure that such acts will not be repeated. With all the talk about Negro riots in the North and demonstrations in the South, I want to remind this nation that the Negro has ever been the victim of violence. We do not condone violence when used by racist and reckless people of any color. But if a spirit of brotherhood is to prevail, we will need the protection of the law for our righteous work. That is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. addressing the Mississippi burning murders in August of 1964. In response to a reporter's question, and by the way, the audio of this was too poor to subject you to. I didn't want you to have to strain to hear Dr. King. Anyway, he says that if the killers of those three civil rights workers, quote, go unfound and unpunished, it may serve to encourage others to engage in the same kind of violence and terror. Martin Luther King Jr. did not live to see Jerry Mitchell's work or the men held responsible for the murders in this book. But I just felt that it underlined how important it is to continue to fight for justice for people no matter how much time has passed. It serves not just as justice for them, but maybe it'll make somebody think twice before throwing a bomb, weaving a noose, or pulling a trigger. Again, the book is Race Against Time. A reporter reopens the unsolved murder cases of the civil rights era. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying the book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. I can't thank Jerry Mitchell enough for joining us and for his decades of work on behalf of justice. It's great that he's sharing those stories with a new generation, inspiring them to carry on his work, not just here in the United States, but around the world where stories of injustice and bigotry live on every single day and the killers go unpunished. After all, inspiring us to be better people and have a better world is a big part of what history is all about. Remember to check out our guest at MississippiCIR.org and to follow him at J. Mitchell News on Twitter. And while you're at it, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean, Instagram at The History Author Show, or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of The History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before there are tears in the eyes of the regular guys oh new york ain't new york anymore